Can the arts keep us young? Tonight on The Best Times, we drop in on the senior studio classes presented by Creative Aging to see how the arts can change lives. And speaking of changing lives, nothing changes things more than the arrival of a new grandchild. But are you ready to be a grandparent? Funding for the best times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. We all know that diet and exercise, along with a good night's sleep, is a formula for a healthy life. But can participation in the arts benefit our well-being also? Numerous studies have shown that learning a musical instrument can improve our cognitive abilities and reduce the risk of dementia. Singing or acting can build self-confidence and provide a social atmosphere that can prevent loneliness and depression. And painting or ceramic art helps improve motor skills, cognitive function, and builds the self-esteem that comes from the act of creation. For 16 years, Creative Aging, a local nonprofit, has been bringing the arts to our older population. And this year, they're trying something different. It's called the Senior Studio. Creative Aging has been entertaining audiences at nursing homes, retirement facilities, and senior centers since 2003. Today they have over 80 artists on their roster and stage over 650 performances each year. The majority of performers are musicians, every genre you can imagine, from classical to country. Over the years, we've featured a number of their performers on this show, and every performance has been a hit no matter where they go. Sometimes the music is even participatory, such as the drum circle, led by Frank Schaefer. For these participants, banging on a drum for an hour is great physical and mental therapy. In 2016, Creative Aging started their Senior Art Series, bringing the arts to those who are aging in place. Held multiple times a year at Theater Memphis, the Senior Art Series features Memphis performers like Joyce Cobb, singing from the Great American Songbook, and actor Ron Jewell, who brings Mark Twain back to life with his convincing performance. This year, Creative Aging is starting something new. It's called the Senior Studio, and it features a multi-week series of classes in various artistic endeavors. At the Bartlett Senior Center, Lee Cagle is teaching a six-week class on playing the dulcimer. As Lee points out, the dulcimer is one of the easiest stringed instruments to play, which makes it an ideal choice for older hands. We tuned it so that all the strings were in harmony, and you only have to play one string and you can play note for note on the melody string and you don't have to worry about chords. When you do something like a, a guitar or a mandolin, the fingers have to reach around a fretboard and you have to put down at least two fingers to get a nice sound. And so that's difficult for young fingers and older fingers. And this, they can just put their thumb down and go. Besides the entertainment value of being able to play a musical instrument, Lee says learning to play the dulcimer, or any instrument, is a brain stretcher. It makes them think about something that they've never done before. The studies will tell you that, that doing things like crossword puzzles are great, but you're doing something that you already know. And so this is learning something totally different. They say, well, I don't know anything about music, but I, I always incorporate something about music and make them actually think. They don't have to memorize it, and they don't have to be good at it. It just opens up their brain to thinking in a different way. 
The response to the dulcimer class was so great that the Bartlett Senior Center had to add another weekly class to handle the volume of people who wanted to learn this classic folk instrument. Back in Memphis at Wesley Tower, a group of residents are learning the craft of ceramics. During this six-week class, the participants will learn techniques that will enable them to create several completed pieces. Each person's piece reflects their own creative idea as they apply different glazes to their artworks. The glaze, which looks a bit like mud right now, will turn into a brilliant color when the piece is fired. Aside from creating a beautiful piece of functional art, these students are improving their motor skills. And, as their instructor points out, a ceramics workshop is a community event. The community aspect of it, uh, interacting with, with other people, um, they just light up. And I, and I, I feel like this type of art um, workshop lends itself to being very social. These acting students at the Bigford Senior Center are performing an exercise called Freeze. The group is given a situation to ad lib. After 30 seconds or so, someone new tags in and changes the scenario. The other actors must ad lib in this new scene. The participants in this acting class are learning skills that they will use in an original show, which will be performed at the end of the six week class. But learning is a two way street, as the instructors discovered. I learned so much. It was like, I'm creating a project and I'm learning a complete legacy that I didn't know about and I feel as though I was well equipped to speak about black history but they gave us so many of the small nuances that they went through personally that their mom and their grandmother and their great grandmother stories that they passed down to them and it was just such a enriching process. When we were filming, we felt a palpable energy in the room. It was exciting to experience the enthusiasm of these 60 and 70 year old first time actors. And they will carry the rewards of their performance to their next stage. It's like a lightness that comes over them, even so much a glow. You can see people that came in like, mm, okay, we don't see what this is about. And then they leave like, yeah, I'm excited. I want my daughter to come. And if it's beautiful to be a catalyst for someone to see themselves like they've never seen themselves before. And it's, it's amazing. To find out more about the link between aging and the arts, I spoke with the executive director of Creative Aging, Mia Henley. Let's start off by talking about the senior studio because that's what you're calling it, right? That's correct. Um, tell me about the genesis of the idea and where it's going, the kind of feedback you've gotten so far. Well, <clears throat> Creative Aging started Senior Studio uh, this year in 2019, and the genesis of it is that really research. Um, Creative Aging has been working for 15 years to engage seniors with the arts in different ways, and we've had workshops during that time, but they are just one hour workshops where someone comes in and does a demonstration and, and then leaves after an hour, an hour and a half, and, and while that is very valuable, um, the idea of having a workshop that was four, six, or eight weeks where there were deeper learning objectives um, and a chance for seniors to walk away feeling like they really learned a new skill and enjoyed themselves uh, as, as the process developed over time. That's something that we've been wanting to do. And so um, the stars aligned and we had some uh, wonderful grant funding come forward from the Durham Foundation that allowed us to pilot this program this year. And so our goal is to hold 10 sessions this year and uh, see how it goes, make some adjustments and keep going in the future. Well, what kind of feedback are you getting from the participants, the students, the if you will? The students, our students are fantastic. So I'll give you a good example. One of the classes that we've had is a dulcimer class and that was held mm -hmm. at the Bartlett Senior Center, uh, which is a very engaged, dynamic senior center. So we, we put out a sign up sheet or, or the people at Bartlett put up a sign up sheet and they got eight people right away. And so they said, could we do another one? I said, well, sure, let's see, let's check with the instructor. And she, uh, Lee Cagle, who's a fantastic dulcimer teacher, agreed to do that. So the Bartlett Senior Center had, and they're, they've now completed that six week dulcimer session. They had two different classes of eight, and they loved it so much that they're going to be continuing that class 
uh, themselves. The Bart we have we have essentially la launched dulcimers at the Bartlett Senior Center, and that class will continue there in the future with Lee Cagle as the instructor. So we're absolutely delighted. I mean, this is exactly what we want to happen because, really, Chris, people. When, when you tell people that the arts are good for seniors, they say yes, yes, yes. They they don't disagree with you, but it's not always on the front of anyone's agenda. And so our role at Creative Aging is, is also to be an advocate for senior involvement and engagement. And what we were able to do was bring a class like this to the attention of the Bartlett Senior Center. Make it easy for them to hold it by bringing them the instructor, by helping supplement the cost of it. and you know, the next thing you know, they have a whole group of people that have a new interest and it's something that um, they're really enjoying. I have to say, when we were shooting, the day yeah. we were shooting the mm -hmm. acting class, uh -huh. uh, that is one of the most enthusiastic groups that I have ever seen. Yes, it is. Yes, it and is. it's interesting, when I was speaking with the two instructors who uh -huh. both looked like they were 30-somethings, I would mm -hmm. guess, right? Uh, they told me how much they were getting Absolutely. from the participants. I mean, specifically talking about the history, the first-hand history of like the Civil Rights Movement, the Jim Crow era, that they were learning right. from them. What kind, of, what kind of feedback are you getting from the instructors themselves? The instructors love it. I mean, seniors are a wonderful group of people to work with because, you know, it's, it's, it's quite different than teaching children who, who might want to be doing something else. When an adult takes a class, whether they're a senior or not, they're there because they want to learn. And they're, I mean, I think we've probably all said, oh, if I could go back to college now, you know, what I would do, what I would study. And so the people that come to senior studio classes are really excited about learning and they're uh, appreciative of the instructor. They, they listen, you know, they don't have to be told to quiet down and, and things like that. But the acting class at the Bickford, uh, Bickford is a community center that has a really strong senior program um, through the Oasis of Hope. And the seniors at Bickford loved that acting class. It was just unbelievable. It involved improv, it involved some singing, and then as you know, at the end of the eight week course, they put on a performance which they co-created with Princeton James, uh, the instructor and his assistants. Um, Princeton is a local uh, director and producer of plays and they just did a fantastic job. Yeah, Let's go back to something you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. about aging in the arts. Uh -huh. What is the relationship between aging and the arts. Why, why, does, why do the arts matter as we age? Well, you know, as we age, we can uh, tend to get into a sedentary role and, and not have as much stimulation in our lives. And the arts are an absolutely amazing way to spark a person's cognitive vitality, to help their brain cells regenerate. Because as we age, we, we're still building new brain connections, uh, but we need uh, new stimulation for that to happen. Something different has to happen in our brains to, in, to spur those brain waves uh, and neural connections to activate. So the arts are, are, are one way that that can happen. Um, there's, there are lots of studies out there that f have found you know, dramatic uh, social, emotional, and actual physical health improvements occurring in the lives of seniors who are engaged in the arts on a regular basis. And that can be you know, I think sometimes people think the arts are, are the fine arts, and they can, it can be the fine arts. It can be the symphony and the, and the opera and uh, theater and things of that nature. It can also be, uh, you know, a, an art form that's very popular in the Memphis area, blues or jazz, um, watching, you know, fire eaters on the street. I mean, there are, there are lots of ways to uh, inspire our minds through the arts. You know, there's so many new studies now talking about isolation and the dramatic impact negative impact that isolation has in people's lives. It's a very, very serious health risk. And in senior communities, that's a real issue. Um, the arts are an incredible way to bring people out of their shell, if you will. They're the little house they live in, the apartment that they live in, and bring them down to a common space where there's something happening that's a real community connector. And I can tell you many times when we have shot in the past, mm -hmm. I've seen people in nursing homes, in yes. memory care units, right open up yes. when the band starts playing a song that they recognize. Right. So there's, you know, there's a physical aspect, they get to moving, there's an emotional aspect right. as well. Right, yeah. right. You know, when you, when you see the dramatic change that happens and you, the faces of the seniors as they watch the music, the mood is lifted, the spirit is lifted. And, 
you know, having a sense of hope uh, is an incredible thing for people and, and a sense of connection, feeling like they belong in a community. You know, it's, it's one thing for young uh, college kids to go off and live in a dormitory with, uh, you know, hundreds of people they don't know. But when we ask people who are 75, 80, 85 years old to go do that, it's a different thing and it's not quite as easy. So it's a wonderful thing to see the arts bringing people together and they do that for people of all ages mm -hmm. and seniors are no exception. Well, Mia, thank you very much for being on The Best Times and talking about creative it's aging great to be the here. Arts. Thank you. Becoming a grandparent is one of life's rites of passage. You look forward to the joy of welcoming a new member of the family and swell with pride as you watch your children become parents. But being a grandparent means adjusting to a new way of life. Are boomers ready to be called Mima and Papa? Are you really ready to become a grandparent? At the Women's Pavilion of Methodist Hospital in Germantown, a group of expectant grandparents gathers for a two-hour class called the Grandparent Connection. Registered nurse Kathy Aiken is the class instructor. With her help, these grandparents-to-be will be ready to welcome a new family member. For many of these expectant grandparents, it will have been 20 or 30 years since they've cared for a baby. So the class begins with the basics. Things like the proper way to hold a newborn, the correct way to swaddle the baby, and of course, changing diapers. New technology such as modern car seats and baby monitors are discussed. A significant portion of the class is devoted to baby safety, making sure that the new grandparents are aware of household hazards to the newborn. And if an emergency like choking should occur, these grandparents are taught the proper infant CPR technique, which is a different process than adult CPR. The world of baby care has changed since these couples were parents. To find out more about those changes, I invited Kathy Aiken to our studio. Kathy, in your class, your students, uh, they've all been parents. Uh, they have been successful at raising their children. Certainly they have the experience and the knowledge. So my question is, doesn't that success and experience being a parent translate into being a grandparent? You know, new parents want their parents to understand the changes that have been happening. So they want them to have the knowledge that they're researching because they have everything at their fingertips and they get all this knowledge ahead of time where us as grandparents of, well, this is the way we used to do it. <laughs> 20 you or know. 30 years ago, yeah. Yes. Well, you're talking about the differences. What has changed in that 20 or 30 years about parenting that grandparents need to know about? Safety is a big thing that's changed. Uh, you know, how the baby sleeps, where the baby rides in a car, you know, how you're going to feed them, how you're going to care for them. Not that it's really changed, it's just we can do better. Well, you pointed out when we were talking earlier the fact riding in a car. I mean, you took your child, first child home, not in a car seat at all. Not in a car seat, in a little carrier, and we had him in the front seat with us, sitting in my lap. So now you don't do that. We, you know, we have laws that tell us where the child is supposed to be up to four foot nine or 40 pounds. <laughs> With, the, with your students, do they tell you, do they communicate to you the issues and concerns they have about being expectant grandparents? I think their question uh, is just the fearful. They don't want anything to happen when they're in care of the child. And so many of them are gonna be caregivers, uh, you know, for their grandbabies. So they wanna know the things they need to know. Of course, all the things that kids have, um, you know, the different things you can go and buy and purchase on Amazon are just a plethora of things and they don't know anything about how these things work from a bouncer <laughs> to a, you know, this thing that's called a rock and play and all these things that are different because we didn't have those. So that, they, they want to know about all those things. They want to know about feeding and, you know, because that's a big push we have with breastfeeding now. And a lot of them didn't breastfeed or didn't know about pumping and then how they can still be actively uh, involved. Uh, in doing research on this segment, I ran across an AARP article and it had five don'ts, five things that you should not do as a new grandparent. So let me go through these and just get your comments. Number one is 
don't tell your kids how to raise their children. Well, they're not going to listen <laughs> because I think this generation, you know, they've got their own set ways. So you've got to, there's no need telling them, oh, you're not doing this right because they're going to tell you if you want to see your grandchild, you're going to do it the way I'm raising them. And so, yes, that, that's a no-no. I would not do that. <laughs> Number two is don't forget how to say no. So in other words, don't, don't be afraid to say no when they call up at the last minute and say, we need a babysitter. You never want to say no to your kids. You don't want to, but sometimes you've got to because of your own uh, life that you have, your own commitments, and so they may not take it pleasantly uh, because a lot of times I think some young people might take advantage of, of the grandparents, mm -hmm. especially if they live close. Number three is don't compete, meaning don't compete, the spouses compete, or competing with the other set of grandparents. And I haven't really seen the examples of competing with the couples themselves, but between grandparents, typically the grandmothers, you know, about the time one might get to spend. Um, because sometimes I think you do see a connection between the mom who's had the baby versus if it's her son-in-law, and they kind of feel like there's competition about, well, she gets more time than me. And, and you know, and I think that's just a motherly instinct that you have sometimes because you've got that bond because that's your daughter that's had the baby versus your son. But I see that competition and it can go as far as buying things, trying to bribe, I'm gonna take you to dinner, you know, things like that. So. Yeah, well, the point is it's not a competition. It's there's not no, a competition. There's no trophy awarded uh, for being not. the best grandparent. The, 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 <laughs> probably the uh, parents are, are happy about some of it, but it can turn into a battle yeah, and well, cause conflict between a marriage. Yeah, I wanna talk about that because actually number four, I think, could lead to conflict. Number four is don't disregard parental rules. Even when you're taking care of them, you gotta listen to the rules they have, even if you may object or disagree with how their parenting uh, may be from what they're letting them eat to where how they're letting them sleep or, you know, not picking them up when they cry. You know, there's all kinds of things. So yeah, there's there's all kinds of stipulations that you have to look well, at. Well, how do you how do you deal with that kind of conflict, which is inevitable? Because I would think grandparents, as you said earlier, they said, I did this 20 or 30 years ago. It was good enough for me. It should be good enough for you. How do you communicate to them how to pass along their knowledge in a positive way? Well, I think still sharing, you know, just because they may not be always listening to what I'm saying, I think they did parent, they did a good job because They've got them, so I think it's a good idea to still share the information, especially when you can see whatever they're doing may not be perfect. And I think they may listen to what your, you know, what your knowledge that you have, you know. So I think that's important to still share it, even though they may not like it. <laughs> um, you know, that we'd be failing as grandparents or as parents not to share the information we have. The last one, number five, is don't be too pushy. Uh, I guess don't just show up at the door and say, I want to see my grandson or granddaughter. I think a lot of the parents that we have now, they set rules early on. Now, if you live in close, close proximity, you know, I think that some grandparents do take advantage of that and we can see that in a positive way if, if mom is willing to accept what they're there for, if they're not just there to come and take over versus coming to help. Um, because I think our new parents, um, I think it's overwhelming, number one, getting the new baby in the home because it's a different generation of, of use to instant gratification. So I think they welcome that part. But if you're coming over to tell me what I'm doing wrong or what I'm not doing, I think that can push you away. And they, they may, you know, of course, as a grandparent, I can speak for saying that you don't want to hear, well, you just stay home today. Because <laughs> you don't want to miss the opportunity of spending time with your grandbaby. But yes, you can be too pushy in what you see is the way you should do things when they're doing it their way. All right, uh, last question, and that really is your best advice to expectant grandparents. I think to, um, you know, don't miss a moment uh, because life is short. You know, take every opportunity when you can. Um, speaking as a grandparent who has one that lives far away, you know, thank goodness for technology that you can FaceTime. Even that, or sending cards so that the grandchildren have you know, a physical piece of something that shares that. But to grandparents that are in our class, you know, we send them home with 
We want to help you to know the basic information of what we know to the best of our knowledge, how to care for the baby, how to care for the mom, uh, and the dad, we don't ever want to forget the dad because he's going through this too, as well as the safety things that have changed so that they can be the best that they can be for their grandchild. So I think that's the important part. Well, Kathy, thanks for taking the time out to come here okay. and tell us You're about welcome. how to be a grandparent. Oh, thank you very much right. for having me. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources and send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.